vegetable farm. We don't need alfalfa. Cover crop. How many people know what cover crops are? Amazing. Congratulations. What you're going to find out about our current agricultural system is it's missing cover crops. Okay? Cover crops are essential to restoring soil so that we can continue eating from it. You have to remember, we're all plant eaters, right? When we eat a pepper or a bean or a grain or barley or a fruit, the plant's roots go into the soil and it's a mining operation. That plant is mining the soil of minerals and nutrients. The, those nutrients are poured into the food that it's producing and then we take it, hijack it from the farm and leave. What's, how is the soil going to be restored of its nutrients? A major way is by planting crops that only are for the soil itself. So what I'm doing here is we're planting alfalfa, which is a legume, and uh, legumes fix nitrogen and turn it into nitrogen that's, that can go into the soil and support other plant growth, and the roots go down and, and break up the compaction of the soil and loosen it up and, and, and improve the, um, the soil life, and that's what's happening. So these kinds of methods are, are, part, of, uh, are part of really what an organic or regenerative agricultural system is. What percent of the farming in this country do you think occurs like this? Less than one. Less than one percent. So if farming doesn't occur like this, you start to have soil loss and soil degradation. And if you have soil degradation, then what happens is the food you're growing in the soil is in, uh, has low nutrient value. So 99% um, of the farming in this country takes place like this, uh, with a lot of uh, heavy machinery and it's chemical based. So, um, let's go over the content of tonight's lecture a little bit. We're going to first give you, um, we're going to connect in this general uh, way, farming and the way f uh, we farm to our health care problems. Uh, how many people in this room would consider that the health care situation we have in this country today is at a crisis point? Everyone. Why? Well, okay, you're getting to me again. <laughs> Neil Barnard wasn't enough. Now you're working on it. Well, I think it's no secret we can't afford uh, all of the care we're dishing out, right? And what's important to remember is everyone keeps talking about a health care system. It's not a health care system. It is a medical care system. That's the problem. We spend trillions of dollars meeting out Medicare to take care of chronic medical problems that don't have to be. We're going to take a look at those numbers. Then we're going to talk about what farming has to do with that and why it's at the root cause. We're going to talk about the same farming methods and their environmental impact. We're going to talk about how we got these farming methods, courtesy of our federal government. We're, talk, we're going to talk about the, the conflicts that the USDA has between um, making farming policy and also making health policy at the same time. And then maybe we'll talk about some solutions. And then after that, we're going to maybe have a little Q&A session if anyone wants to ask some questions. This is one of the scariest graphs I've ever seen. This is what has happened to the spending in our healthcare system since 1960, as of 2015. And I want you to pay attention to the decade between 
is starting in the early 70s until 1980. You notice that our healthcare expenditures were just flatlining and then they started to take off. Does anyone want to hazard a guess as to why this would have occurred in that decade? Mm, pesticides uh, leaching into our food. Mm, I don't think so. It, it takes a long time for pesticides to cause cancer and other kinds of chronic diseases. Uh, fast food and processed food, um, perhaps, or, you know, I think it has something to do with our food system. High fructose corn syrup, you know, I think that, I think that you're getting close. I think there are answers to be found there. Monsanto, yeah. So you're all saying the same thing, the way we grow, the way our food system changes. So this young gentleman is saying it's, it's, a, it's a complicated amalgam of the drug industry, right? It, which is very interesting. You know, if you look at the 1960s, I, I know there are doctors here are probably around for a while. We didn't have a lot of drugs in the 1960s compared to what we had in the 70s and 80s. You have to remember, it wasn't until 1967 that our own federal government even recommended that we treat hypertension with pills. That, was, that came from a famous study of the Veterans Administration in Washington. So what important thing happened in the mid-60s that, that completely changed healthcare in this country? Medicare. Medicare was given to senior citizens. Before then, there was no secure system for people who are older than 65, which is random. And all of a sudden, the Johnson administration granted a, 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 you know, a health care entitlement to senior citizens. Huh. And then you have a lot of senior citizens, older people, who have entered their period of morbidity, right? Where you start to get, you know, later on in life, more chronic illnesses. and. If you want to come to my lecture tomorrow night, we'll learn about the period of morbidity and, and the reasons to go plant-based and how we can stop that. But as you get older, you get that's when all these chronic illnesses come home. So uh, all of a sudden, all these people had coverage. And then, guess what happened in that decade, in the 70s and 80s? We discovered very expensive treatments for the number one problem in America, heart disease. Coronary bypass surgeries, stent placements. Uh, before the 1970s, late 60s, there were really no cardiac intensive care units. These are very expensive uh, treatments. The thing I'm gonna add is, we're gonna find out later in the lecture that something very important happened in the early 70s, and that was a change in federal agriculture policy. And that supports some of the comments uh, a lot of you were making about changes in our food system. Okay, here's a graph from the World Bank uh, of expenditures in healthcare by the different industrialized nations. You can see we are the outlier uh, on the top line and below that, we have all the other countries, all of whom, guess what? They have socialized universal medicine as an, an entitlement, health care. We do not. And the odd thing is, even though we're paying vastly more money, we have poorer outcomes by many measure, including uh, an abysmal infant mortality rate. And we don't live as long as a lot of these countries that are listed there. So we get it on both ends, when you're brought into the world and when you leave it. And that last graph, which ended the first graph of, of rising expenditures, which showed that um, meteoric rise, 
ended in 2015, but the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services is projecting that we will have an inexorable rise so that by the time uh, we reach 2025, as a percentage of all the money we make in this country, the chunk will get larger and larger that we put towards healthcare until it reaches 20%. Um, for that 2014 figure of 17.5% has officially risen as of 2017, which is the last year we have numbers for, to 18%. So 2017, we spent three and a half trillion dollars on this medical care. It is estimated that 86% of it went for chronic preventable diseases. That's $3 trillion. Diseases that could be prevented and reversed. The Affordable Care Act, right? What happened? It was supposed to hold down insurance costs. It didn't. They continue to rise, both for the employee and the employer. That's why you see these monolithic companies like Amazon and, and Google trying to find their own solutions to organize healthcare systems. They can't afford these rises. This slide is from the CDC, okay, and one in two adults in the United States has a chronic disease, and one in four adults in the US has two or more. And across the bottom of the slide, you'll see what these chronic diseases are. Okay. For the most part, all preventable. Heart disease is number one. Cancer, number two. Chronic lung diseases, a lot of this is uh, emphysema as a result of smoking, but there is asthma in there too. Uh, strokes, which in large measure are preventable by controlling risk factors for strokes like high blood pressure, salt intake, Alzheimer's disease, right? Besides that one little mistake he made about the New Jersey crack, didn't we learn how we could prevent Alzheimer's disease yesterday from Dr. Barnard, right? What you have to eat, the way you have to move, and all the other lifestyle activities. And of course, type 2 diabetes is almost solely a, a diet-related disease. So three trillion dollars. Can you imagine what would happen if we could wa a wave a magic wand over America and get everyone to eat plants? We would have trillions of dollars every year to do magnificent things. So, this meteoric rise in healthcare costs, which is so frightening, a lot of people will say, well, it's due to drug costs. Because as we get sicker, you know, these drug keep companies keep coming up with new drugs, especially in the cancer arena. Some of these drugs can cost a quarter of a million dollars for a round of treatment. Um, you know, the White House currently is on a campaign to control drug costs, right? A lot of people say this is a major factor. Other people will say there are not enough primary care doctors. Studies have shown that primary care doctors take more economic um, considerations when they're taking care of patients and managing their illnesses, and they, they take care of patients from a monetary perspective much more efficiently than specialists. We are not st still, in, 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 uh, since my day of graduating, still not turning out the primary care doctors we need. But I'm going to tell you that's not the reason either. And then of course, people will say there are too many people still without health insurance and when you don't have health insurance you wait until you get too sick when your disease is very expensive to treat. What I'm here to tell you is that these are reasons, but they're not the foundational reason for this rising cost. It's our USDA. They're the reason for this 
the base reason why we can't afford these expenditures. It's the United States Department of Agriculture that determines what we grow in this country through their policies. And that determines what the country eats. Here we see maybe a, a typical lunch made at home. Um, maybe if you want to go out to a restaurant, if you're in an average town in America, you may see something like this on the main street. These places exist serving cheap food at the taxpayer's largesse via federal agricultural policy. The reason why you can get hamburgers so cheaply in these places is because their production is ultimately supported by agricultural policies. So let's say you've gotten the memo that eating a McDonald's is not so good for you. Let's go to the supermarket. We'll do a little shopping, right? And we'll get make a home-cooked meal. This is what happens when you go to the supermarket. If you are serious about preventing cancer and heart attacks and strokes, 80% of the shelf space of an American supermarket is off limits to you. How did we get this system? And why is it like this? Again, federal agricultural policy has changed the way we grow food in this country. So the two, by far, major crops that are grown in this country are corn and, which is number one? Soybean became number one in 2017. For years and years, since agricultural policy changed in 2017, it was corn, but soybean just overtook it. Let's take a look at corn. So, the vast majority of the corn grown in this country is not the corn that humans eat, uh, that we have a tendency to eat, which is sweet corn. And here, you can see this, this was a little uh, children's poster at the Indiana State Fair, which is a big corn grown, Indiana's a big corn growing state. You can see that in 2009, Indiana grew 42 million pounds of sweet corn, which only humans eat, but they grew 49 billion pounds of genetically modified corn, and we just don't eat that. That goes to where? In what kind of facilities? Okay. CAVOs are concentrated animal feeding operations, okay. and they pertain to all kinds of animals, and in 2019, 98% of all the animal foods eaten in the United States come from these facilities. If you're eating a chicken, piece of chicken, uh, or if you're eating a piece of meat, or drinking a glass of milk, there's a 98% chance it came from one of these facilities. So what has happened is, what has allowed these facilities to blossom? the production of corn and soybean. And this is why. You know, when a cow is out on the range and a cowboy is taking care of the cow, they eat grass all day. When they're in a warehouse, they have to be fed. And this is what the animals are fed. This analysis was done by the Johns Hopkins of Bloomberg School of Public Health. It was a detailed analysis of what is in the feed stock of the animals that are kept in these facilities. So the first level of ingredient is grains, and that's what we're talking about. It is mostly corn. There are some other smaller categories like millet and amaranth and some other grains, but for, for by and large it's GMO, genetically modified seed corn. Next. Uh, oil meals and cakes are mi mixed in. So here we see the vast 
fields of soybeans, what happens to them? Does anyone know what an oil, oil meal and cake is? Well, we'll get to this when we get to the soybeans, but this is what's left over after soybeans are squeezed for their oil. The oil goes somewhere else, but the bean itself, the meal from the bean goes to the animals. Next, rendered animal products. These facilities create huge amounts of, of material that humans don't eat, including hair, um, hoofs, eggshells, um, bones, skeletons, hides. These are valuable materials to the CAFO industry. They are taken to facilities where they're melted down, cooked down into a meal, and then shipped back to the CAFO to be mixed in to the feed. So what you have is you have chickens eating cows and cows eating pigs and pigs eating pigs and you know these animals are especially the herbivores they're just supposed to be not eating these kinds of foods you can imagine how sick they must get and especially in confined quarters they have to be constantly pumped with drugs to keep them alive it has been estimated that if you took all of the materials that were coming out of these rendering facilities, you could fill, bumper to bumper, a four-lane superhighway running from New York to Los Angeles with tractor-trailer trucks carrying this material that comes out in one year. 4D animals. Does anyone know what this means? Dying, disabled, diseased or dead. These animals are now allowed to be put into rendered animal products. There was a hold on them during the mad cow um, scare a number of years ago, but no longer, according to the USDA. These CAFOs produce huge amounts of manure. Anyone remember the hurricane in North Carolina? Right, there was, there was manure spillage problems from all the hog farms. What do you do with all this manure? You can put it back into the feed and feed it to the animals. And then of course, all the drugs and all the antibiotics to keep them alive. And this is, when I was doing this research, what I found most shocking, plastic. So in beef cattle, before they are slaughtered, the week before they go to slaughter, they are fed uh, small plastic pellets, about two kilos worth, because they have so little fiber in their diet, um, the slaughterhouses want them to continue to defecate. So when they're slaughtered, there's not a lot of stool in their colon to contaminate the slaughtering process. And they count these plastic pellets as fiber for the animals. So of course they're pooping this, and then they feed this plastic back to the animals next in line, right? Because they feed the manure back to the animals. And at this point, if this is not horrifying enough, I just want you to consider this. This is a major reason why um, animal foods in the United States have a magnification of toxins in them. Does anyone know about the concept of biomagnification? <coughs> As you go up a food chain, um, and you get higher up on the food chain, as one animal eats another, and then the one eats the one before it came before that, you start to accumulate all the toxins in all the creatures that came before you. That's why we're told not to eat tuna, right? Because it has high mercury levels, because it's the top predator. It eats all the smaller fish before, right? Same thing with swordfish, right? The biggest fish in the sea have, are the most poisonous in general because of biomagnification. Can you imagine what the pesticide levels are in, in all these animals that, and, and heavy metals and dioxin? Horrific, right? 
let's go on to examine soybean. So when a lot of people hear soybeans, they say, oh, well, soybeans are so healthy, right? They are healthy for humans to eat, but the problem is very little of this soybean crop ever ends up on a, a dinner plate, less than a percent. 98 to 99% of it is processed. As I described to you for, before, that oil is extremely valuable. And after that oil is squeezed out of the soybean, they take all the meal and they feed it to the animals. And of course, this is genetically modified too. This is from the Pew Research Center. It shows how our American diet has changed just since 1970. Does that sound familiar to you? Right? 1970, when our health expenditures started going up. As we Probably a lot of us know red meat eating has decreased in this country. But look at the tremendous rise in chicken, the consumption of chicken, and shockingly, cooking oils have, have had this enormous rise. I want to examine soybean oil a little bit because it's our number one oil. It, soybeans are our number one crop, and they're primarily be gro being grown for its oil. So when you look at the fat composition of soybeans, um, that, geez, I'm sorry, this doesn't work, but you can see soybeans are right here, and they have a pretty large blue, blue bar. That blue bar is linoleic acid. It's an omega-6 acid. Omega-6 acids are inflammatory acids. They're essential. We do need them, but we only need small amounts of them. We need more omega-3 fatty acids, and they always have to be balanced. I want to draw your attention over to the last chart since 1970, that top red line is the rise in soybean oil consumption in this country. Um, you have some other oils. In, in general, all oil consumption has gone up, but you, you start to see a, a very significant rise in canola oil, that red line in the bottom graph. in roughly almost 100 years. This is the change in oil consumption that we see. Almost all oils we're consuming more of. 500% more olive oil, 550% more corn oil, but the winner is soybean oil. There's been a 116,000% increase in soybean oil consumption. Even the runner-up, which is canola, is a puny 16,000%. The most striking modification to the American diet in the last century is the greater than 1,000-fold increase in the estimated per capita consumption of soybean oil. Huh, maybe that has something to do with our healthcare expenditures. When we test human fat tissue, there's been a significant increase in this linoleic acid in human fat. When we, when we examine human breast milk, um, human breast milk today has three times the amount of linoleic acid than human breast milk did in the 1950s before we changed the way we farm. There is a growing um, research into the link between how linoleic acid can cause the obesity epidemic in the United States. And you know, the, uh, in the United States, uh, one third of us are obese and over half of the country is overweight. And once you have obesity and weight problems, that leads to all of the chronic diseases that we were talking about before. 
So, linoleic acid, uh, here's a little biochemistry for you, is the mother molecule for arachidonic acid, which has been found to play a very important role in something called the endocannabinoid system. Endocannabinoids, cannabinoids similar to cannabis, right? Receptors in our central nervous system. And what we're beginning to figure out is that this linoleic acid through arach increased arachidonic acid uh, levels disrupts normal signals in our central nervous system for hunger, for fat storage, and for how many calories we burn. And it, down, it upregulates hunger, increases deposition of peripheral fat and visceral fat, and increased arachidonic acid levels decrease our pilot light on the number of calories we burn. These same farming methods that have created havoc in our, the American people's health are now creating havoc in environmental health. So um, this dead zone, does anyone know what that is? In the Gulf of Mexico, which is where the Mississippi River pours its water to, it is filled with um, fertilizers and pesticides and all kinds of things, but primarily fertilizers create huge amounts of algal bloom that kill off most sea life. It is said that this area is now the size of New Jersey, and if you go through this area, you can find nothing, no life except for algae. There is no sea life in this, in this region. It's called the dead zone because of all the chemicals that are used to grow these corn and soybean crops. The monarch butterfly, which is one of the most magnificent migratory creatures on Earth, is threatened with extinction. We're trying to figure out why. Some of the reasons might be because we've plowed over every square inch of fertile ground to grow these monocrops of, of genetic modified corn and soybean. The, the monarch depends on wild uh, milkweed in order to feed and bear its young, and there really isn't not much of it left. The other thing is that all these pesticides probably put a dent into its life cycle and result in mortality. These chemicals that are used to maintain this system of corn and soybean now rain down upon us. The US Geological Service measures Roundup in raindrops. It is there. It was thought to be uh, Montsanto who, who developed um, glyphosate or Roundup, uh, said that it was a very short-lived molecule and disappeared, but that's not so. And in addition to glyphosate or Roundup, there are many other pesticides that are now coming to us through the rain. Does anyone know, people know what epigenetics is, right? So just a little explanation. Epigenetics, you know, in the 1950s we had Watson and Crick, and they were the first scientists who described DNA. We, for many years and many decades, we thought that DNA were the, was the instruction booklet for each of our cells, and it is, which determine what happens to us, who we are, and our makeup. Uh, all, the, all the things our cells make, it determines that. Um, until about maybe 15 years ago, when we started to discover that uh, we, everything that happens to us may not be because of that original instruction booklet we inherit from our parents. What happens is as we go on in life, um, there may be molecules which become attached on top of our DNA, and then they alter the instruction booklet or the function of it. That's called epigenetics. 
it is now thought that pesticides play a leading role in the epigenetic changes that bring about mutations and may be a major cause for autism, attention deficit disorder, cancers, and for endocrine disrupting diseases like diabetes. How did we get to a farming system like this? Well, it started during the Depression. In, at the beginning of the Depression, in about 1931, uh, 400,000 families, farm families in the United States lost their farm. These farms went belly up. They couldn't meet their mortgages. And in a response, uh, the Roosevelt administration decided to enact subsidies for farmers to make sure that um, the markets were balanced, that they weren't growing too much food, which they couldn't sell. And then the federal government also alleviated them economically by uh, buying crops. Uh, so, and, and also having them not plant some of the land. If, if the government uh, analyzed there to be too much of a certain crop. And that system existed uh, until 1971, 1971-1972, when President Nixon appointed this man as the Department of Agriculture Secretary, Earl Butts. Earl Butts um, decided to change this entire system. And he had two mantras, which are very famous. He told American farmers to plant fence row to fence row. In other words, he wanted commodities planted, huge amounts of them, and of only one type. And you were to plow everything, every possible spot on your farm whether it was it had soil on it, it was to be plowed under and planted in this wetlands, uh, woods, uh, to be maximally efficient and to get maximum yields. So, in addition to this, he told family farmers, either you were going to do this, get big, or get out. So if you couldn't do this, and, um, and you couldn't grow, become this monolithic large farm, there would be no government help for you anymore. Thus came the rise of factory farming. And all these commodities we see today, the, the huge amounts of corn, the huge amounts of soybean, the huge amounts of wheat, we didn't talk about that, but that's the third, number three crop. It's, it's very small compared to the corn and soybean, but all that wheat, goes into all the processed foods that we see here today. And at the same time, he was known to be an enemy of sustainable methods. He made this comment, before we go back to organic agriculture, somebody is going to have to decide what 50 million people we are going to let starve. That system still exists today in, in, in its functional form. There have been some changes in agricultural policy through the, does everyone know what the farm bill is? To, instead of giving farmers direct subsidy to grow all of these commodity crops that are so harmful to us, uh, they've the, found other ways to support them through crop insurance programs. But there's a reason why all this stuff is, is grown, and it's because our tax dollars support it still. The 2018 Farm Bill has come out, right? It's the new Farm Bill. Nothing has changed. We are still growing the same stuff. We've had a very nice time on this trip eating a lot of plants, haven't we? Who grew these plants? Well, 
it is highly unlikely that any plant you've eaten here has ever been supported by a dollar from our federal government. Isn't that amazing? We're here to be healthy and to eat healthy meals and nothing we are eating is supported by our federal government and everything that makes us sick is supported by our federal government. Is this the reason why we have such a crisis? And not for nothing, but I'm just going to bring New Jersey back again. Remember I told you New Jersey was in decline agriculturally? We did save a million acres, but it used to have like two million acres of viable farmland. Now there's a lot of you know, suburban housing tracts. New Jersey used to grow all these fruits and vegetables. The United States has become a food importer for fruit for the first time last year. That's right. The United States now imports more than 50% of all the fruit we eat and imports one third of all the vegetables we eat. And it is estimated that within a few years, the United States will be importing 90% of all the fruits we eat and half of all the vegetables we eat. And the USDA does not have good controls on the way these foods are being grown overseas. And studies have shown that they have many times the pesticide levels as federally uh, inspected crops here in the United States. These policies has, have led to a, a foodscape like this, which have led to a medical care system like this. And to make matters worse, there's a conflict of interest. So not only does the USA promote these policies that grow this disease-causing food, but on the back end, then they tell us what to do to become healthy through special programs. The, the USDA has a specific marketing program. They spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year to find a place to put all the cheese. People heard Dr. Barnard's cheese lecture, right? To find places to put it so that they can unload the cheese into us. These are your, well, this specific program is not our tax dollars. They charge, it's a checkoff program, they charge farmers of money to do this marketing for them. But it is done by our federal government. Soda with high fructose corn syrup was the most popular shopping item on the list of food stamp SNAP recipients. That's the largest entitlement food program of, that our federal government has. We spend $80 billion a year. And it's being spent on soda for some of the most deprived and sickest and poorest people we have in this country. I think we should have the USDA stop subsidizing the, the unsustainable production and consumption of unhealthy food and start subsidizing the production and consumption of healthy food. Thank you. But there's a lot of deep pockets that fund these wheels that are turning and it's very hard to reverse. I think we, we all have to do it every time we pick up our fork and feed ourselves and give videos that you get here from these magnificent presenters to your family until there's just not a demand to eat this stuff anymore. Because I mean, I've tried, I've gone on a speaking tour in this last year in preparation for the 2018 Farm Bill. And it's just really hard to change when there's so much money that is directing these expenditures. However, I just wanted to make you 
aware of a program, there's a little, little shaft of light that does exist. Did you know that the, the USDA had one tiny little program where they gave food stamp recipients extra stamps to go eat vegetables? In Connecticut, two years ago. A few hundred people. This is a documented program in South Africa. A major health insurer gave this program to hundreds of thousands of people in South Africa, where they gave them a um, stipend of $500 per month per family to buy healthy fruit, plant-based foods. It was the most popular program in South Africa. People took that $500, they bought those plants and they ate them. It still goes on. I was having a fight with my medical scribe the other day. Does anyone know what a medical scribe is? So scribes are, are assistants to the doctor now. Everything has become so complicated with electronics. You know, doctors used to just take a pencil and write on a piece of paper, but no more. Now they have an assistant controlling the keyboard and the electronic medical record because there's so much going on there. And we started to get into a little bit of a political discussion. And, and she started saying, you know, we can't have a universal health care system for everyone. Who's going to pay for this? If you gave with this kind of problem with these diseases, if you then let everybody in, we would go bankrupt overnight, right? We can't pay for it now. And although there are about almost 20 Democratic candidates who have said that they support this, I know that Michael Bloomberg has come out publicly saying that there's no way we can afford universal health care. It's, we don't have the money for it. Someone should tell them about plants. And someone should tell them about how to grow real food. And through these methods, we can pay for it, right? Three trillion dollars we'll have. What do you think? Okay. I'd like to take some questions, if there are any. I'd love to hear your comments about the French study that came out uh, last October uh, showing the uh, quartile that uh, ate the most organic food had 20% less cancer occurrence. Thank you. We're beginning to realize that these pesticides are, uh, are carcinogens. I mean, I think that became evident with the jury's verdict in California. Everyone knows about that? regarding Roundup. They awarded over $200 million to this man who developed um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And finally, the legal team had access to the documents that Monsanto was hiding for all these years. There's a reason why, you know, Monsanto was sold, do you know that? <laughs> to Bayer. There's a reason why Bayer only had to pay $60 billion for it, because they have a couple of hundred dollars worth of liability from cancer cases that are going to be brought to the courts. Hi. Um, if by some miracle everybody did start eating plants, how would we prevent the analogy of factory farming from happening to the growing of plants in, in our country? How would we you know, prevent the something like what's happening with corn and soybeans from happening, you know, so that we're able to feed everyone. Hmm. Are you saying what would happen to the CAFO system if everyone started? No, not mind? the CAFO system. What would, I, I guess what I'm saying is if we're having to feed so many more people plants because everyone's eating plants, how would we prevent uh, 
lot about cuisine and the growing industry for human beings. Well, to grow them, and to grow them regeneratively, to grow them like but people know that people do. People know that we didn't always use chemicals to grow plants. From does it, does everyone know when agriculture started? About about ten thousand BC. E. So from ten thousand BC all the way up until when were we growing food for the world without chemicals? Just before World War One, you know, the first decade. Maybe if you look at fruit farming. That's why when we got our farm, we tested the soil to make sure there were no orchards on it. Orchards, orchards start using lead arsenic as a pesticide, as an insecticide in the 1890s, 1900. Orchards, not vegetables. But before that, you know, we grew food without chemicals. If anyone wants to read a fascinating book, there's a book that was written for, uh, over a hundred years ago. It's called Farmers for 40 Centuries. It is about all the Asian cultures, Korea, China, and Japan, and how, what their agricultural systems were and how they got to be so populous and ha had millions and millions of people with these 4,000 year old agricultural systems. Never used a chemical. They used a lot of manure. They used cover crops. So I think that, um, I think uh, we have to, the way to do it is to take that 1% and start to have we didn't talk about this because it's outside the scope of our presentation, but to have the USDA, have your tax dollars go to support farming that was, that, that's regenerative and supportive of environmental and human health instead of supporting this stuff. I've got a question. Um, I have a question uh, regarding these capos and slaughterhouses, a subject that I'm totally unfamiliar with. Um, I've also heard that, that there are uh, veterinarians hired by the U.S. government to inspect meat, and I'm just wondering what you know about that system and what kind of a veterinarian would choose to do that as a profession as opposed to, you know, working on cute little cats and dogs. So you can just talk about that because I'm just kind of wondering what you might know about it. I don't know. But I, I, I suppose I can also say that there are doctors who push drugs into death row patients too. And it is, a, um, it is against the Hippocratic Oath to kill somebody. But every state that, that has lethal injections right, employs a doctor to kill the prisoner. So, you know, if that's a moral issue for the individual veterinarian. Uh, you know, veterinarians to me are supposed to be helping living creatures, right, to be healthy. Yeah. By the way, a fabulous presentation, really fabulous. What an education. Thank you. And, and what I would like to know from you, being in the medical profession, it appears, and it's really fairly evident, that the lobbyists have taken over this whole ball of wax, and it really has corrupted the system. What can you, as the medical profession, or the medical profession do to control this? And I worked in manufacturing uh, for many years, and I worked with lobbyists, and I know how they corrupted, and a lot of my people went to jail because of all this stuff. So what can the medical profession do to control this because it's really crazy. Thank you very much. That's an excellent question. To tell you the truth, I think the medical profession can most directly amend this situation by, by advising patients to eat plants. It's the most direct route, right? Because um, 
as you alluded to, there, there is such moneyed interests involved and in, 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 that have so much of an ax to grind in this system that it's just difficult to, to you know, move the system beyond a certain measure. So I think that's the way to do it. And, you know, a lot, we haven't talked about, there are many issues, peripheral issues that sort, sort of intersect here. Um, the issue of sustainable farming, you know, growing things, even growing plants, right? Growing plants without chemicals um, leads to soils that are sustainable. Uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to our healthcare system. Uh, that's going to go down. But something that's going to go down planetary-wise is our climate. And there are major studies. One of them was funded by the Rodale Institute that links our climate change uh, in a major way to the degradation of soils from all these chemicals. If we were to farm with the regenerative and organic methods that we were talking about in the beginning, it is estimated by the Rodale Institute in their white paper that we could store all of the carbon that we are generating into the air within our arable lands, all of it because soil was meant to do that. We have to eat plants, and we have to grow them without chemicals, and we have to take care of our soils, and I think that's the way we can save our health and save the planet. How do you feel about Fukushima and what happened and um, any radiation getting into the soil and water supply of especially cow, cow organic? Mm -hmm. <coughs> You know, I, that's a tragedy, and uh, I can't speak specifically to it, you know. Um, it, it was a nuclear disaster. I think, it's my opinion overall, I think that uh, there are many more dangers presented by burn of, burning fossil fuels in the end analysis than there are by nuclear accidents. What is your true confidence in the USDA's uh, organic label, especially considering we're going to be uh, importing most of our fruits and vegetables? So your current confidence and your confidence moving forward. That is an excellent question. And I have some good news for you. So when we opened up our farm, we gathered the community because we wanted to figure out what they were looking for. And we did a focus group. And we asked them a, a very interesting question. We asked them, uh, what kind of certification do they believe in as being healthy? And uh, we asked them about the term naturally grown, without chemicals, you know, sustainable, organic, all these terms that you see. And hands down, the community responded that they don't trust organic USDA. Can you believe that? They didn't trust it. But the last question we asked them was, well, would you prefer any of the other terms? And the, everyone in the room gritted their teeth. They all voted unanimously. Eh, no, I guess we'll get certified USDA organic. So does anyone know where that term came from? What the history of that is? So the Rodale Institute, J.I. Rodale, invented, his son invented that term organic. And the federal government in the 1980s came to the Rodale Institute. It's about 30, 40 minutes away from our farm in eastern Pennsylvania. It's, the, it's one of the founding institutions of, of regenerative, well, it is the founding institution of regenerative and organic agriculture. The federal government came to Rodale and said, listen, we want to make a, a label that certifies, for people who don't want to eat chemicals, that's going to certify the process of organic agriculture as you describe it. So Rodale Institute got very excited. They said, OK. And the government took it and bastardized. 
their organic philosophies. So today, when you eat an organic apple that's grown in Washington State, it can have tetracycline sprayed all over it. Or it, can, it is most likely to have pyrethrum, which is a broad spectrum pesticide which can kill human beings. It does come from chrysanthemums. That's why they allow it. Also, organic certification doesn't necessarily dictate all those important things of what I told you about how you take care of a soil. You can grow a tomato in sand if you want. And in fact, a very scary thing is the USDA has approved hydroponics for organic certification. So when you eat a tomato grown in water without any soil, you won't know the difference. It can be organic. And organic farmers were fighting against this, but they approved it anyway. So what I'm trying to tell you is the USDA has significantly watered down what it means to really grow good food. Rodale has come out with a response. Rodale has created a new certification. It is called Regenerative. And they are partnering with such partners as Patagonia and Dr. Bronner's the company that makes these natural soaps and cleaners. And uh, they will, to get this regenerative certification, you will first have to be certified organic by the USDA, and then they will grant you, Rodale will grant you a regenerative organic certification. And in that certification, you can be assured that farms employ all the methods we were talking about, and more including fair pay to workers uh, and social conscience to make, uh, make sure that we're not taking advantage, the system doesn't take advantage of weak links. So that's coming within the next year. Regenerative organic. Here's the other topic I just want to tell you. Look, there are a lot of local farmers that are around you and these farmers you know, it takes money you, you, to be certified organic. They don't certify themselves, so they don't have the money and they don't have the paperwork. But if you know these farmers, you can, they will, they're so happy to have you walk on their farms, they'll invite you, and you look around. If you don't see a shed full of pesticides and chemicals, if you see cover crops in the field, if you see compost, they're doing things in the right way. You patronize them. We have time for one final question here. Well, actually, my, qu my question is almost identical to that, because most of us, I think, buy produce from local farmers markets, or we try to support them. And I was just, and they seem to be, obviously, seem to be more expensive. So I was wondering if this becomes corrupt, but I think you answered my question by saying you just have to do your own homework and, and get a feel for the local uh, organic produce uh, markets. In your you do. And, you know, farmers love Farmers love to be talked to at the, at the farmer's market. They put in, a real farmer growing real food puts in so much hard labor. They appreciate when you ask them how they grew the food. And they will invite you to the farm to look at it. I just want to make one last comment. We often hear that every week or so, someone will say to me, well, how do you justify the increased cost of organic? And someday we will find out that raising food with chemicals is the most expensive food that was ever grown. In terms of when you have a child with autism and you look at that child and, and their lives cannot be saved, there is no amount of money that is worth growing food like that.